sing song. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God for. Wow, that's amazing. On Easter Sunday, we get to start with a choir online. Thank you, Brett, Chris, and the whole team for putting that together. That's a great way to start our day. And welcome to Easter services at Central. He is risen, and he is risen indeed. And we're glad that you've chosen to join us today, uh, there in your home or wherever you are watching us. Thanks for being a part of our services today. If this is the first time that you've joined us, we are glad that you're here. Thanks for finding us on Facebook or YouTube, and thanks for joining us and being a part of our family today. We'd love for you to take a minute and fill out our guest survey. It's online at centralrr.com slash connect. That's just a great way for us to, to be connected with you in a, in a challenging time to be able to stay connected. Um, also want to ask everybody, hey, take a picture of you and your family together. You're dressed up for Easter and that's kind of a big deal. And we would love for you to take that picture and then post it online. Post it on, on Facebook or, or some kind of social media. Tag Central Baptist in it so we can see each other and see your beautiful family and celebrate together, even though we're socially distancing apart. Uh, we are one family under the banner of Christ. Hey, kids, we want you to know you're important to us. Matter of fact, Jesus himself said that our faith should look like you. And so we want you to lead out, lead out in worship, lead out in listening, lead out in the whole service today. Uh, there's resources for you online at centralrr.com slash kidsonline. And we would love for you to get those resources and even be a bigger part of what's happening here because you're important to us. Today, we get worship with Brett and the team. We get a great message from Pastor Mark, but we also get to hear from two ladies in our church, Susie and Salida, and their stories are going to bless your heart today. It's going to be an amazing addition to what God is already doing in these online services. You know, as I stand here, our, our church building is empty today. But you know what? So is the tomb that Jesus was in. It's empty today. And if Jesus had stayed in the tomb, his story would not have made a difference. And if the church stays in the building, then we don't make a difference. We have been pushed out of the building into our homes and community. And it's time for the church to rise up and make a difference. He is risen and we can rise up and celebrate the risen King. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that Jesus came and died for us. And today we celebrate his resurrection from the dead. He didn't stay in that tomb. And God, we are not called to stay in our little circles either. And now we have the opportunity in our homes and in our communities as we take walks to rise up and be the church. And just as Jesus rose from the dead, we will rise up too. And I pray that today that you will just jump in the middle of all of this worship, that you would take the, the stories that are going to be told and the message that's going to be shared and just put it deep in our hearts so we can be more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Growing up, we didn't really go to church much. My mom would sometimes take us, but it was just a thing we sometimes did. And God was more of a concept than a person to have a relationship with. So when I was around 12 to 14, I was really going through basically some addictions that I felt like I had no power um, to break or get out of. And I just was kind of heartbroken. 
and I would just cry out to the Lord at night and I didn't even like really know God but I knew that there was someone there who cared and that just kind of that heartbrokenness made me seek Jesus and just one night I got up from my bed and I was like there is victory and there is um, healing from all this pain I'm feeling and I gave my life to Jesus and I didn't really know what that was going to look like but I knew that it was that he was the truth and I knew it's what I wanted. I feel so much more peace and joy and I just every single day that I walk with the Lord I know that he's real and true and it's so amazing. I feel a lot more patient and just that I have a purpose in life. I would say Jesus brings me freedom is the main thing and Jesus also brings me joy. I know that no matter what I'm going through, whether it's COVID-19 or just a bad day as a teenage girl, that there's a purpose and that there's a deeper joy that I'm seeking. Jesus is my best friend, I would say. Um, that may sound a little corny, but He's there for literally everything. He's the person I probably talk to most. Um, he's there for my tears and my laughs and just, he's so faithful. There are answers to your questions. And when you give your life to Christ and fully give everything you have over, even the things that hurt you or you think other people are gonna judge you for, he's gonna come in and restore it even if you think it's too dark the lord wants wants your heart and he cares about you and he loves you who am i that the highest king would welcome me I was lost but he brought me in Oh his love for me Oh his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh is free and deep I'm a child
Great, your love was great. 
Um, Jesus is my comfort. You know, when you get married, Johnny and I were both teachers and coaching, and um, it was a super huge secret that we were even dating it kind of until we got engaged, and it was a big thing. Um, it was like, what? These people weren't even dating. Um, we, we just took a lot of pride in that we worked in a place that we needed to keep it separate. And so immediately, everybody was like, when are you having kids? When are you having kids? Even our parents. Um, and, you know, we waited one year, and then we're like, okay, so we'll start trying. And then... After about eight months, spontaneously got pregnant, and it was great and wonderful and super exciting until it wasn't. And, um, you know, that was a hard time. It was a sad time. Um, but I still, you know, you hear people have a miscarriage all the time. And so we just kept trying. And five years later, five, that's a lot of years later, um, we had kids. But the journey was tough. The, um, and my prayer from the very beginning was, Lord, keep us on the same page. I don't want to have kids and not be in the same page or chapter as my husband. That was more important to me than anything. And so we, I prayed that over and over and over. Um, we had another miscarriage after some fertility treatments. That was hard. Um, and then I was done. I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and I knew, I had been praying for a long time um, if this isn't going to be, change my heart, because I know you can. And I was beginning to get at peace with adoption or foster care or anything, and I was okay with it. So I was beginning to think, this is what it will be, and I knew I was okay, and Johnny wasn't. And then I went back to that first question I had always asked the Lord, keep us on the same page, keep us on the same page. And then we weren't, and that was a moment of um, shock, I think, for me. And so we prayed and prayed and prayed, and I finally said, I will do this once more, once more, um, in honoring of my husband and of the Lord. And, and so we prayed and we said, once more. Um, and two heartbeats later, that went almost to term, close enough. They're perfectly healthy now, perfectly healthy, sometimes too healthy, um, bouncing around two little boys, more than we could ever dreamed, more than we could have ever dreamed. Um, and so I think the path of keep us on the same page, keep us together, submit when it's time to submit, um, the Lord can fulfill dreams that were never I never dreamed possible. Even if you're in the midst of it, know that there's another side of it um, through him, not through you. Because, because anything you can fathom isn't good enough. But what he can heal and what he can bring through to the other side is amazing. Salida, thank you so much for sharing your story and your beautiful family with us. Uh, I do want to say hello to John and Mark. Hey guys, thank you for being an answer to prayer, for being the miracle that was prayed for, being life. I know your family loves you. This is the time in our services where we would normally pass a basket and take up an offering. It's an opportunity to give back to God a portion of what he's given us. And John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that's what we're celebrating this weekend is his son that was given, that paid the price on the cross. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And we're celebrating that today. And so this is one of those opportunities for us to be able to give back to him. And if you're a guest and new to us, there's no expectation. There's no obligation in that. Uh, but for those that, that are part of our family, we would love for you to take that opportunity to give as God leads you to do that. You can do it online, centralrr.com. Uh, or you can just mail us a check in the mail, and we'll be picking that up weekly as well. But just an opportunity to give as an act of obedience and thankfulness unto God for all that He's done for us. And I'd like to take a minute just to pray as we transition into that. And um, I want to pray specifically for our leaders. 
There's a lot of big decisions that are coming right now, and I want to pray specifically for Mayor Morgan. I want to pray specifically for Chief Banks. Uh, they have a whole lot on their shoulders and would love to just pray for them. So if you'll join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what this weekend means, and we base our whole hope, our lives, and our future on what Jesus did on the cross and what he did raising from the grave. And we say thank you. And God, we have the opportunity to give. And you never ask us to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. And you gave your son. And we want to give what we can for your kingdom. And so I pray that you take whatever's being given and you would use it for your glory. Uh, God, to impact the kingdom, to impact our community for you. Specifically, we want to pray for Mayor Morgan. There's a whole lot on his shoulders and, and his counsel that's around him. I pray you would give him great wisdom. I pray you give him discernment. I pray you give him understanding so that he can make wise choices for our city and community. Protect him, God, from the lies of the enemy. Guard his ears in that. I pray over Chief Banks, uh, so much on his shoulders as well as uh, isolation and loneliness and boredom can lead to some poor choices. And I pray that we would make wise choices so we make the job of the police easy. I pray that their uh, biggest thing is to come and love the community well. But I pray that you would give him wisdom, give him protection as they intervene in every situation that gets called on. So God, today you be all the glory and the honor and the power because he is risen indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Central, I, I pray that you've enjoyed the worship and the testimonies. I just pray that it's a, a good remembrance of how Jesus rose from the dead and he transforms and affects lives. And, and so I, I, wanna, I want us to open God's word today. And, uh, but let me kind of paint a picture of where we're going today. You know, uh, we as followers of Jesus Christ, we, we believe many things. And uh, when we read the scriptures, there's so much in there. And if we look at different expressions of church that are out there. And sometimes we have discussions, okay? Uh, was it a literal six days of creation or was that just eras of time? Uh, uh, is Jesus going to return pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib? Uh, you know, when is he going to return? These are things we discuss, how we baptize, how we do the Lord's Supper, uh, the spiritual gifts, how different people practice the gifts. These are, are things that we discuss, and sometimes they are secondary issues is where I'm going on this. But there's one thing that all Christ followers have truly, we have this in common, and this is every Christ follower, this is what our faith is built on. And I know the answer we throw out tritely is Jesus. You know, Jesus is what we build our faith on. That's true. However, it is an event is what nails down our faith. It, if, if this event did not take place, then um, uh, all, all the things we believe just do not make sense. In other words, that event is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, first of all, then he's a liar. And who will follow uh, a liar? Secondly, this would make the disciples to be lunatic, crazy people because they're following Jesus and they're giving their lives up for a lie. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. And that would make the church a joke that, because we, we exist because of the resurrection. So that would make us a joke for everything that we do, and it would make us as Christians actually look like fools if the resurrection did not take place. So this event, this one event, so much balances upon for us as followers of Jesus Christ. And there have been people throughout history who came about to disprove the resurrection. And if they could disprove the resurrection, then they think, okay, it, not, it, it just didn't happen. Uh, Josh McDowell is one. Josh McDowell was a scholar, and he, uh, when he was in college, he decided because of, there was some campus crusade and some inner varsity people that were trying to witness to him about Jesus, and he thought, if I can disprove the resurrection, then th they will leave me alone. And thus, what happened is he got into it. He himself became a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lee Strobel, who wrote the book Case for Christ, 
Uh, Lee Strobel was a journalist in Chicago, and he set out to disprove, because his wife had become a follower of Jesus, he set out to disprove the resurrection. And what happened? He couldn't disprove it. He became a follower of Christ and now teaches uh, about Jesus all over our country. So this one event changed everything. I want to begin uh, the scripture portion. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 20. And in John chapter 20, I want to read John's account of what happened on that resurrection morning. So John chapter 20, verse 1, and uh, you can follow along as I read. It says, early on the first day of the week, this being Sunday, the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. This other disciple would have been John, and they can, uh, she's running to them to say that the body's been taken. It's somewhere else. Verse 3 says, So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Everybody's running here. And he bent over and he looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. And, and get this, he saw and he believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. This is John's, the, the disciple who was part of it, an eyewitness. This was his account of what took place that morning when Jesus rose from the dead. And it's incredible to, to read this and to see everything that's in there. However, I thought of it this way. You know how you get into those TV shows, especially the cop shows and, and these kind of things, and they seem to start the show with some kind of action, and you're thinking, how did we get here? How did we get to this point? And then all of a sudden they have a break, and they'll say like two weeks later or 12 hours earlier or something like that. And then they do a backup to get the backstory of what came uh, to that very point. I, I want to I do that this morning. I want to I look at the, at the resurrection that take place, but I want to back up. Maybe a time limit may have been a couple of weeks that set all of this in motion. And, uh, and so I want us to look at this. And it took place in John chapter 11. So you can back up a few chapters and, uh, and see where this thing started from. And it started with uh, Jesus being with his disciples across the Jordan River where John the Baptist had been baptized. But John wasn't, uh, obviously John had been beheaded. He wasn't there anymore. But Jesus had his disciples over there. And something took place in a little town called Bethany, which is a couple of miles from Jerusalem, right outside of Jerusalem. And what happened was, is that Jesus loved to go to Bethany because his best friend Lazarus lived there as well as his uh, Lazarus sisters, Mary and Martha. And what happened was is Lazarus got sick. We don't know what the sickness was, but it was going to lead to his death. And so uh, the, the sisters sent someone to go get Jesus. And so I'll pick it up in uh, verse 1 of chapter 11 in John. And, and let's look and back up and why this set everything in motion for what took place on that resurrection morning. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for, the, for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he didn't go running. He stayed where he was two more days. 
And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now, you see the picture. Um, uh, the servant has come. He tells Jesus, Lazarus is sick. Now, we see Jesus healed certain people from a distance. He just spoke the word and they were healed. But Jesus decided to delay uh, for two days before he was going to go to Bethany and uh, be a part of what was taking place here. And by the time the servant got back, we're going to see that Lazarus had, had passed away. But there's a point I want to make here, and, and I want you to hear this. And this is point number one if you're taking notes. I think it's pretty important. Do not let Jesus' inactivity confuse you. Let me say that again. Don't let Jesus' inactivity confuse confuse you. Just because Jesus did not run at this moment of need does not mean that he was not involved and going to bring God glory through this situation. I know that some of you and some of us are going through things right now and it seems like, God, where are you in the midst of this? Please do not think he's inactive and get confused about what is going on. You see, Jesus lived on a divine timetable. We, we live on a timetable of consumerism. I want it and I want it when? Now. Jesus lived on a divine timetable. And, and this was going to set in motion. He knew this. When he got to Bethany, it was going to set everything in motion that was going to lead to the cross and eventually to the resurrection. But here's another thought under this don't, don't, don't uh, let Jesus' inactivity con, uh, confuse you. Suffering doesn't mean that God is absent. Lazarus is still going to die. The sisters are still going to mourn. Um, this is going to take place. Suffering, we're on these broken planet. We're in these broken earth suits. Suffering is going to come as long as we're here. But do not think that suffering means that God is absent. He's still involved in what is taking place. And here, here's one other thought. Um, when Jesus was going to make this trip, he knew, Father, is this the time? Because he knew when he got to Bethany, eventually in the next week, he was going to be going into Jerusalem and this was all going to set in motion. So don't let Jesus' inactivity confuse you or what seems like inactivity. Um, as we go in into the story a little bit deeper, he has a discussion with his uh, disciples on why he didn't hurry and and, uh, and they have a discussion about, he, they, he says, I'm going to go wake him up. And they think, well, if he's sleeping, he must be better. It's one of those guy discussions, I'm sure, that they just had. And, and we get it in scriptures. But I want to pick it up on verse 17. It says in verse 17, on his arrival, when Jesus got to Bethany, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And verse 25 said this, and this is part of the, the I am's that we're looking at. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. You get that? Underline that, circle it, whatever, let that stick out. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Let's stop right there. Because this is such a huge interaction between Jesus and Martha. And I think we can learn from it right here. The next point I want you to write down is this. Sometimes we believe, but we don't really believe. Now, that sounds weird, but sometimes we believe, but we really don't believe. You know, uh, what Martha says here, after Jesus says, you will see your brother rise again, she said in verse 24, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She, she knew it as a theory, as a philosophy, as a religion, but she didn't know it from her heart at that point. And, and there's three things under this that I want to look at. 
first of all, Martha believed the resurrection was an event. She believed that in apocalyptic history, whatever, that Lazarus would raise from the dead. But she, did, she saw it as an event. Um, it, it was something that was going to happen as an event. Jesus, on the other hand, that he saw the resurrection is a person. It's him. It's not an event. It is him. He is the resurrection in a life. In other words, it's not a religious experience but it's a Jesus relationship. And I think many people get confused to this. They see it uh, um, following Jesus as an event. When did you come to Christ? When did you do this? An event instead of a personal relationship that is there. That is what the resurrection is. Paul, follower of Jesus who wrote much of the New Testament, he said in Philippians chapter 3, he's repeating it over and over again. He was the religious of the religious, but that wasn't anything he needed. He wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. That's what he wanted is to know Christ. So Martha saw it as an event. Jesus saw it as a person. Martha also believed that eternal life was an abstract idea. It was something out there. Eternal life was going to happen. It was out there. It was a philosophy. It was a theory. It's something that she believed in her head. But Jesus, on the other hand, saw eternal life in a personal relationship. In fact, John, who was going to later write the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he said in 1st John chapter 3, he said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only God, and, and Jesus whom you have sent. So he, Jesus saw eternal life not as something out there to live forever. He saw eternal life right now comes in a personal relationship with Him. Not in what you do, but through a relationship with Him. Billy Graham, the, the great evangelist, and it's been quoted by many different people, but he said this, he said, most people miss eternal life by 18 inches, the distance from the head to the heart. Because they got it up here, they believe it up here, but there's never been that faith step. So Martha believed that eternal life was an abstract thing, whereas Jesus saw it as a personal relationship. One last thing about Martha, she believed that victory over death was a future expectation. In other words, in the future, she was going to uh, know victory. However, Jesus saw victory in a present-day reality. No matter the conditions, Jesus makes new creation. He makes all things new. He, victory isn't something that's coming. It's something that we live in right now. Even in the midst of this virus, uh, uh, economic downtimes, we can still walk in victory because of what Christ has done. Let me, let me get to the end of the story right quick because what Jesus does is he, uh, he comes, he, he, John eleven thirty five. 35, many people quote all the time, Jesus wept, he's feeling for uh, these people, the, uh, Mary and Martha and the, and the people. In verse 38, it says, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And this is what he said in verse 39. Take away the stone. And then he took away the stone. And then what happens is, is that he cries out in a loud voice is what they said, because they talk about the odor of the body and this kind of thing. But uh, in verse 42, I knew that you always hear me, and he's praying to the Father, but I see this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. This is about... Jesus showing who he was. And then verse 43, when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now, here's the next point I want you to write down. The stone needs to be rolled away. And here's what I mean by that. I look at the commands of this. What did Jesus command? And people say, well, he commanded Lazarus to come out. But before then, he commanded the people to take the stone away that was blocking the entrance. You see, before life could come, the stone had to go away. And it's the same thing with Jesus. The stone needed to be rolled away, and that happened. But he told the people, take the stone away. I wonder what stone could be keeping you from a victorious life in Christ. Is it the stone of unbelief? 
It's a stone of uh, a, a sin glitch in your life that you're not willing to deal with. It is, is it a stone of the past, a stone of failure? I don't know what it is, but I think the Lord is saying today, listen, if you want to experience me, it's time for you to roll that stone away and experience me afresh and anew today. Maybe it's unbelief, and this Easter, you just need to to put your faith, not in your knowledge, but in who Christ says that He is. Uh, I read this quote this week. The stone was rolled away from the door, not to permit Christ to come out, but to enable disciples to go in. And it's that same way with the stone of Lazarus. The stone was rolled away so that life could come forth. But that stone needed to be removed. And so my question to you today is, is there a stone that you need to roll away as you come and let Christ um, uh, deal with you today? And then the story ends with Lazarus coming forth. But let me go back to where we started. Because what happened is, is after Lazarus was raised, the religious leaders got together because this really aggravated them. And they said, let's let one man die instead of the, all of the nation dying. They, they felt like the Romans were going to come in. And, uh, and so they were going to, uh, they were, this set everything in motion at this point. So we go to Jesus. He's crucified. He's buried. And then comes the, the, what we read at the beginning. He rose from the dead. I think what's interesting about this is that he is, he is not there. He is alive. He is alive today. And uh, you need to experience him today. You need to know him today. Because what he did is he even took the burial linen and he put it in a neat order because he is going to come and he is going to return someday. So the fourth point is a return day is coming. There is a time coming when Jesus will return. Um, Somebody asked an old pastor one time is that why did Jesus call specifically in a loud voice for Lazarus to come forth? And the old preacher said, if he hadn't mentioned Lazarus by name, all of the bodies in all of Bethany would have raised from the dead at that time. I want you to know a day will come. I don't know when it's going to be, but the Lord will call your name. And he will say, come forth. And are you ready for that day? One quick thought is, is your faith a theory, a philosophy, or is it a living relationship with the risen king? I want you to know Jesus is alive. And there is a day when he is going to return. And maybe it is for you today to prepare yourself for that day by getting the stone out of the way and saying, Jesus, bring your life to me. I end with this thought. You know, in our world, the, there are pyramids in Egypt, and they're famous because they have mummified remains of ancient Egyptian kings. There's Westminster Abbey in London, which is renowned because it rests the bodies of English nobles and notables. There's Muhammad's tomb, is noted for the stone coffin and the bones it contains. There's the Taj Mahal, which was built as a memorial to a wife of one of India's shahs. And there's Arlington Memorial Cemetery in Washington, D.C., which is revered for its honored resting place of many outstanding Americans. And these are great places, but all of them are honored because they have dead there. Listen, we honor the tomb because there is no longer a dead one there, but he is alive. And our prayer this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday, is that you experience the risen Christ and He is alive. I want to pray with you if I could. Father, the tomb is empty. There is no bones there. And uh, one day you will return. And Lord, we, uh, we look forward to that day. There's a little bit of apprehension because, Lord, we, we struggle with still the flesh and the sin areas. And, Father, there's still some stones we need to get out of the way so that your life can flow through us. And so, Lord, today, I pray for everybody watching that this will be a day of transformation, a day of life change, and that we will see you, just like 
Lazarus, Jesus, you said that you would bring glory to the Father through this. May you be brought glory today through this time. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Bell Central, I hope uh, the message in this worship time was a uh, good blessing to you. It's a good challenge. I've got four questions, though, that I want you to either to go over with your spouse or your small group or your family or whatever. I think these will help you apply uh, what you heard today. Question number one is pretty simple, but is this. What is your favorite Easter memory? Think back to childhood. Think back uh, during the years. And what was your favorite Easter memory that you had? Question number two is this, is that when is a time when God seemed to be silent? You know, those times where you just wonder where he's at. And how did you respond to that silence? So discuss that. When was a time that God seemed to be silent? But how did you respond to that silence? Question number three is this. What is a specific situation you need to trust God to work out in your life today. Uh, whether it's with the virus or economics or work or family or whatever, what is the specific situation that you need to trust God with today? And then the last question is this. How can you tangibly express gratitude today for the resurrection of Jesus? The greatest event in all of history how can you tangibly express gratitude today? I'm so glad that you joined us. Uh, this week is going to be a special week as we continue on. I want to encourage you in this way. I want to encourage you to pray. Uh, I spoke with uh, both Mayor Morgan and our Chief of Police, Alan Banks, this week. And both of them just asked for prayer. I was checking on them and their families. But they're just asking for prayer. Prayer for our community. Support our community. Pray over our health care and first responders. So I want to encourage you to do this. Uh, tomorrow is our Unceasing Prayer Day. This week is our Pray the Rock Week. So let's be a praying church that's lifting up our community. I've encouraged the other pastors in the area to challenge their people the same way. Let's be the big C church and let our light so shine so that people may see God's good work and give glory to Him. Love you, Central. We'll see you next week. God bless you.